Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to episode three of the Heroes and Legends podcast. And for those of you, maybe this is the first episode of this you've listened to. Uh, this is an audio podcast, and this really is a way for me to slow things down a little bit and have a conversation. Just sit down and kind of talk with everybody in a more casual, relaxed way. Typically, my videos are about news. They're about talking about card reviews. It's a lot of information. It's a big information download that I'm trying to fight to get through quickly as possible so the videos don't go too long. This is not that. <laughs> this is about topics that are, I think, relevant, mostly magic, although I do like to throw in the occasional non-magic topic. We're going to do that a little bit today at the end of the show. But we're going to talk about magic in a more casual, kind of laid-back way. And I also am working on improving the podcast a little bit with some new graphics and stuff. I do want to put up a, uh, eventually get together a kind of a ticker that will kind of talk about the topic we're on, next topic, that sort of thing. So I do have some ideas to improve the show, definitely. But for right now, I just have a few things I want to talk about today. So let's get into the topics. Three things I want to discuss. And the first one, we're going to talk about the Pro Tour a little bit and how basically I felt that went as far as the coverage and that type of thing. Secondly, I want to talk about core sets. Uh, it was a hot topic about a week ago or so. I just want to chime in, give my two cents on it. And finally, I want to talk about something that impacted me quite a bit this weekend, which isn't magic related, but in some ways it is. I mean, I always end up tying everything back into magic because I spend so much time thinking about it now with the videos I make and everything. But uh, I want to talk about Derek Jeter of the New York Yankees, his number two retired by the organization last Sunday, and really what Jeter's career has meant to me personally. So let's get started with the Pro Tour and some of those top moments from the Amica Pro Tour. So uh, this weekend, I hope you got a chance to watch some of the coverage. I think it was pretty good. I think they did a real good job with coverage. I'll give you my thoughts on that in just a second. I did talk about the event in more technical detail in my last video, so I don't want to go into too much into that again. But I will say, in case you weren't aware, Jerry Thompson won. He was playing Mono Black Zombies. Really happy to see Jerry Thompson win. This is his second top eight. His first one felt like it was just yesterday, but it was actually like 2013, I think. It was Gate Crash. So it was a while back now. It was a few years ago. But I'd like to see those like Star City Games grinders come out and take down a tournament and do well on the Pro Tour, like your Brad Nelsons and now Jerry Thompson. Like I'm really happy to see that when it happens. And I don't know, maybe because I watched some of the Star City Games coverage and you just kind of know these people and you almost get to know them in a more personal way when they're on the Star City Games open because they're on there like week after week just grinding away and you see so many feature matches with them and they have the little cards that talk about their personality and their fun facts and stuff like that. Their coverage is really good, of course, especially when Cedric and Patrick Sullivan are there. They're incredible. So I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm just really happy to see that. As far as the World of Standard goes coming out of that tournament, um, we saw in the top eight four Marvel, Etherworks Marvel decks. Now, even though Etherworks Marvel is taking up about a quarter of the field or so, the decks were not all the same. And there were variants of those decks. They came in different colors. Some were more controlling style. Some were more mid-range. So there were different versions of those decks out there. Don't get me wrong. It feels a little unfair to lump them all into one. But at the end of the day, they're using Etherworks Marvel. They're hitting things like, like Ulamog, stuff like that. Now, we saw three zombie decks in the top eight, of course, two mono black, one of which that won. One was a black and white. And then finally, the top eight was rounded out by a green black energy aggro deck. And that's a deck that's been around for a little while, too. As far as the big news of the weekend, Mardu Vehicles didn't do so well. <laughs> so a lot of those decks did not make day two. They were a big portion of the field. They were the biggest portion of the field, as a matter of fact, at over a quarter of the field. And a lot of them didn't show up in day two. They really did struggle. Now, it's still a good deck, I think. I think you could tweak it and kind of adjust with the meta, and it could still be a force. But at least as of right now, I think Wizards 
kind of breathed the sigh of relief that they didn't have to say we got four copies of Mardu vehicles in the top eight and so on and so forth. That just plain didn't happen. I'm still a little concerned about the diversity of magic because typically this is as diverse as it's going to get until our devastation comes out. Because now that we've seen the Pro Tour, things are just going to get more and more streamlined as we go forward over the next few weeks, assuming there isn't some sort of banning that shakes things up. But if not, then where do we land? Is it a two, three deck meta again? I kind of hope not, but I feel like I don't know how many decks can really pull into that like top tier level. Like right now, the Marvel Works decks are there, the zombie decks are there. Although I will say, I think the zombie decks are not very hard to sideboard against. All you need is some board sweepers, like a Fumigate or something like that. And that's going to really hurt those decks in some ways, if you can work that into your sideboard plan. But aside from that, you have some other strong contenders like of course you have other energy decks and you have some other interesting things out there control control didn't do as well as i think a lot of people expected this weekend is a control i think could be tweaked though to kind of get there and maybe be a thing it's just going to take a little more adjusting i guess we'll have to kind of wait and see on that one now the coverage itself I think they did a really fine job. I was really impressed, as always, with the LSV. I mean, his commentary is excellent. Marshall, I like Marshall a lot. I know some people like him, some people don't as much. But I feel like Marshall's kind of like The Rock. Like, he's very professional. He's a consummate professional. He interacts very well in the booth, no matter who he's with. He plays his role really well. And he's knowledgeable. Yes, he's not a pro. He's not an LSV, right? But he does stream a lot, and especially when it comes to limited, he's a very knowledgeable person to have around. He's not going to always know everything. He's not always going to be 100% correct, but that's okay because it's not his role. You know what I mean? So I like Marshall quite a bit. And even the folks that have been there a long time, like Rich and BDM, I think they are in really strong roles for what they are doing now. It took a little time, especially as time evolved, and they were starting to change the way they do coverage. I think Rich is fantastic at doing the statistics, the numbers crunch. I think you need that role. Not everybody's maybe interested in that type of thing, but for the people that are, you need that role. And secondly, I think BDM going down, doing the player interviews and getting to hopefully humanize the players a little bit, I think is a real smart move and just help people connect with them a little more. His interview with Mark Mueller, yes, that was hilarious. Um, <laughs> I hope that, I don't know, did they did they edit that out of their clip, I wonder? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you can find it online if you look for it. It was quite entertaining. But aside from that, I mean, just to all his interviews with the players, I think that's a great idea. Uh, Chris, Christian uh, Calcano, he got really emotional when he got into the top eight. And, you know, that type of thing, that's the drama that is beyond the game that I think they need to bring to us. I mean, you see that in sports coverage, right? It's not just about watching a baseball game or a football game or a soccer game or what have you. It's about getting to know the players. And when they win, sometimes they get emotional. Or if they lose, sometimes they get emotional. It's building that connection and reporting on that. Like, that's part of the story. So I think they did a good job with that. Uh, technical hiccups, still there. I, I think that's the low-hanging fruit they just need to kind of get a hold of. Like... I don't know. I, I assume that they're trying to do a lot with very little, kind of like I do when I make my videos. <laughs> um, I'm sure they are underfunded for what they're trying to do, and I'm sure that's why it is. But it seems like little things, like the Twitch commercials, for example. I don't mind watching a Twitch commercial. I mean, that's if it's going to help me get Pro Tour coverage or maybe another GP this year, I'll sit through the Geico commercial or whatever they want to show me. But um, <laughs> that's fine with me. But it's just kind of like, you know what? The, every time... And I think it's just because of the natural lag from the stream. Every time they put on a commercial, they cut off the last segment before the commercial. So I'm sure what was happening was they were wrapping the segment. They were going to their page where they just kind of cycle through the photos of the players and stuff. And they just went ahead and hit, okay, do the Twitch commercial. But what they weren't taking into account is there's a delay from the actual live broadcast to what we're seeing on our TVs. So... The Twitch commercial came on and basically cut them off every single time. Like those little things, like it just makes the appearance overall just feel unpolished. And that's kind of a problem, I think. So, yeah, if they could get those little things, like the little audio hiccups and the little video hiccups, like when they switch to a camera and you see BDM looking at his phone and the camera like drops to the ground, like, <laughs> like that type of stuff. <laughs> like they just need to get a handle on that to the best of their ability. And like I said, I'm sure they're working with 
the minimum that is possible because that's how big corporations work. They're not going to pour any more money than they need to into something. But I think this is something Wizards or Hasbro could invest in to polish this presentation more. And it's going to draw more new people to it. Polish is a big deal when it comes to stuff like that. When you're trying to attract new people, us old timers that watch the pro tour time and time again, we don't care. I mean, we're going to get, we're going to complain about that stuff, but we're still going to watch it. But the new people are going to turn around and be like, what is this? You know? So if they see one of those hiccups and stuff and they're, they're going to lose people. So yeah, I hope that's something they take seriously going forward. But overall, I would say they did really good. I think it's probably the best pro tour coverage I've seen up until this point. They're getting better and better and better. And again, little technical things. I mean, those are going to happen to some degree when you're, you're, you have an event that's going on for days and days and days. So there you go. My thoughts on it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Let's move on to the next topic I want to talk about. And that is corsets. So this was something that came up. Oh, I don't know. About two, two weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago now. And I wanted to be responsible, I guess, on how I reported this. Here's the story in case you for some reason didn't hear. Uh, now, Wizards has a marketing forum that they put out there where they have people go in and answer questions and they make their future decisions based on some of the results, obviously. Now, typically, I'm not sure exactly how Hasbro Wizards does this, but typically a company would outsource this to another company. So this is probably not Wizards or even Hasbro directly creating these surveys and stuff like that. This is probably an outside company that's taking information most likely from Hasbro or through Hasbro from Wizards. There's probably a middleman in there playing telephone game. <laughs> and so they're taking this information, moving it to this firm, and they're trying to collect data to push back to Wizards to help them make decisions and Hasbro to help them make business decisions. Now, because of the weird disconnect here, We've seen things leaked before through these surveys. <laughs> um, and that's kind of awkward when that happens. Uh, but this came up again, I think it was about a week and a half ago or so now. This question showed up in a survey. I'll read it real quick, but it is on the screen. Every year, Magic releases numerous new card sets, each exploring a different corner of the Magic Multiverse through unique settings and gameplay themes. In addition to these expansion sets, Magic also releases a baseline set focused on the fundamentals, evergreen, quote-unquote, themes and mechanics central to what makes the game fun. These sets should be fun for players of all experience levels, providing the perfect entry point for players while still challenging veterans. We're looking for the perfect name for these sets, and that's where you come in. Which do you think is the best name for a set like this? Is it Prime 2019, Core 2019, Essential 2019, and then why do you think the name you chose was the best? Okay, so this came out. Somebody was taking a survey, got this question. They put it out there, and the world exploded for a second. <laughs> and I didn't do a video on this when it happened because I, I wanted to be responsible in the way I talk about this. I felt like it was a good podcast topic because I could give my full thoughts on it and not just a news blitz or give any sort of misleading title or thumbnail or anything like that. First thing I want to say is this in no way guarantees that there's going to be a course set next year. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've seen market research. I mean, a lot of things could be going on here. First off, this could be an old question that they've recycled because for some reason they're just looking for another question to throw out there because they're trying to collect data and they want to have a lot of data points. So they could have, this could have been a question from five, six years ago and they just changed the date to 2019 and put it out there. This could be wizards just simply saying, you know what? I don't know if we're ever going to do core sets again, but something we want to at least have dialogue around. So is core set the right name? Why don't we throw a question in there and just kind of get some baseline data on that? And that could be simply the end of it. And that could very well be all this is. Or maybe core sets are coming back next year. Maybe it's, it is possible. Maybe they have decided to do that and they're looking to update the name or change the name. So there's a spectrum of possibilities here. I definitely don't want to report this as core sets are coming back next year because that's simply not the case. And I think that's a long stretch based on the information we have at this point. Would I like core sets to come back? Actually, I kind of would. And here's the deal. Of course, the early core sets, I mean, Alpha Beta Unlimited, I mean, I won't count that because that's just magic. Um, but the other core sets, I mean, some had their problems. Their biggest issue was being innovative. 
like revised was building off the original fourth and fifth edition building off the original and you saw that up through probably like sixth edition seventh edition brought foils to the table eighth edition did bring some new things they tried to be a little more uh introspective and look back at the history of magic but then they really didn't do anything different ninth or tenth edition Magic 2010 was a leap forward by bringing new cards to the fold because Wizards kind of realized that it was an outdated idea to think that a core set is going to sit on a shelf for a year or two years and new players are always going to come in and buy it. That just wasn't what was happening in the world of Magic anymore. People were jumping from set to set to set, and a core set could not really be an evergreen set. It, it truly wasn't anymore. It was just something that they thought, well, maybe we'll put out in the summer and get some people who are on summer vacation to go out and buy some new cards and get involved in Magic. And yeah, that's fine, but you didn't see a whole lot of change, even though I did like some of those core sets. 2010 and I think 2011 were great. 2012 was really good too, but then they started to feel stale again, like 13, 14, 15. We started getting the same dual lands every single time, that type of thing. And veteran players, even though there were a few good cards in there, were just happy to buy the singles for the most part. Where they got it right was the last one, Magic Origins. Like, Magic Origins was awesome. <laughs> they had new and creative cards, many of them very term tournament playable. I mean, we got Jace out of there. I mean, that's a ton of play, right? <laughs> but others, too. But what I really liked the most about it was the story. It really was a great way to tell a story. The origin of those five Planeswalkers, turning them into flip Planeswalkers that transformed. And then on top of that, they each spent time in two different planes, the plane that was their plane of origin, and then wherever they jumped to the first time they planes walked. And you had 10 different planes in that set. So you know what? If I'm a fan of Dominaria, there were cards that were based around Dominaria. If I was a Ravnica fan, there's some Ravnica cards. If I'm a Theros fan, there's Theros cards. There were planes that we hadn't seen yet that are going to be a glimpse to something that's going to come into the future. And we saw that happen with like Kaladesh. Like, this is awesome. What a great way to approach it. Now, if you kept trying to do that same exact thing every year, it would get boring again, right? And that's their main problem with these core sets. But if they did something like that every year, but changed it and made variety and took you on a journey, it's not just about a plane, but a story that takes you to multiple planes. What a great I awesome idea quite honestly I would love for that so I hope it does come back in that regard I don't think this means they would go back to a three set block paradigm I just don't think that's in their best interest but maybe what we'll see is instead of like this year we got two master sets which is kind of insane financially I think maybe a master set your regular four standard sets, like your two two set blocks, and then maybe this is your extra set. So Conspiracy, I guess, didn't really sell well. It didn't look like anyway, which is sad because I really liked Conspiracy, but maybe even this could switch every other year with Conspiracy or something like that. I'd be happy to see that. It might keep the set a little more fresh too, but the hard part about that is if they do this, they'll probably like add another pro tour and stuff like that. It'd be awkward to have that switch back and forth every year between another standard set, and not another standard set. So that might not be a solution. I actually wouldn't mind. I don't know if even they, uh, I don't want to say added this as an additional set considering they already have, I think too many products going on out there, but maybe even did something like made the core set, part of another two set block like told the story that way like for example you started off on one plane but then the story took you to multiple planes and maybe the second set was the core set or something like that i don't know like i'd be interested to see that so anyway that's my thoughts on it let me know in the comments below do you like core sets would you like to see them come back do you think they are coming back due to this question or do you think this is just random information i mean do you remember we saw the leak quote unquote from marketing a few months back which supposedly was spoiling the set that was going to come out this fall and it turned out at the very least they changed the name of that set now maybe the whole theme and everything is similar but at the very least the name was not consistent so what you see in marketing research isn't necessarily any indication of what's going to happen in the future but <laughs> There you go. It is what it is. All right. Last topic I wanted to talk about today is not technically a magic related topic, although, like I said, there are some parallels that can be drawn, especially coming out of the pro tour time period. But I wanted to talk a little bit about something that affected me personally and just kind of give you my thoughts on it. And that was the ceremony we saw on Sunday at Yankee Stadium. 
where Derek Jeter, number two, his number was retired. And first off, I want to say the Yankees are running out of numbers because <laughs> they've had so many amazing athletes over the years, and they've retired all the single digit numbers now. This is the last one, and they have quite a few retired numbers, but all folks that deserve it, obviously. So, but I'm here today to talk about Derek Jeter, not just his professional accomplishments. I really want to talk more about his personality and the way he carried himself and how he was a role model for me, I think for many, many other people, and how that applied to my life, I guess, in my career. And let me get started by saying, let me get this out of the way first. Those of you not aware of Jeter, as far as his performance goes, he was one of the best of all time. I mean, he played for 20 years with the Yankees. In this day and age, that's very rare. Usually players in the free agency days uh, don't stay with one team. They kind of go wherever they can go to make the most money, so on and so forth. But the Yankees weren't afraid to pay for Jeter because he was the face of their organization for so long. And he was incredibly successful. I mean, he won five World Series with them. He has a, a million kind of almost magical moments. For fans of the Yankees who've watched and followed his career, everyone probably has their favorite Jeter moment. And there's all sorts of things. The time he dove into the stands, for example, and came out all bloody to get the ball. You know, there was the time he made this amazing play to throw somebody out at home that they call the flip. He just kind of was in this, I don't know how he was even in position, but he kind of flipped the ball in in the playoffs and got the out at home, at home base, at home plate. Uh, there was things like his hit count. I mean, the only Yankee to have over 3,000 hits just within the Yankee organization. Six all time on the hit list. The accolades in that regard just go on and on forever, right? I can just list things all day long that he's accomplished. But that's not what this is about. This is about the way he carried himself and his personality and how he was a role model, not only for fans but also for other players and really just anybody who had the opportunity to see him do what he does. I was very lucky. I saw Jeter play in person countless times. I don't even know, probably close to a hundred times, easily between 75, hundred times I've seen, I've seen him play baseball and you know, that's not going to happen again, you know? And that's kind of sad in itself, but you almost take it for granted sometimes that, you know, Jeter's going to be there and he's going to be, you know, playing in the one spot or the two spot and he's going to be playing shortstop every day. You know, you, you, you take that for granted. And I was lucky to be able to see him play that much and see those teams go out there and take the field as much as I did. Not everyone has opportunities like that, but fortunately in my previous career, I was able to do that. Now, thing is that connects me, I think, to Derek Jeter in a lot of ways is the fact that he started his career. He was drafted in 93, came up to the majors a little bit in 95, but really 96 was his big year, won the World Series that year, <laughs> shortly after became the captain of the team. And I started my career with a very large company in 95 myself, and my career with that company in a lot of ways mirrored Derek Jeter's career with the Yankees. He was leaving when I was leaving that company and changing my life. And it was almost like looking in a mirror in some ways. When I would see those moments, I was leaving my job of 20 years, my career of 20 years behind because things were changing. I had other responsibilities I had to take care of. I had other things I wanted to do. And he was the same way. He was going through the same thing I was going through. And I got to watch it on TV every night when I came home from work, right? And I got to see his last game at Yankee Stadium. I got to see his last game, which took place in Fenway. I got to see him go on that journey and talk to the press and talk about leaving it behind, but being happy and optimistic about what was next in his life. And I was going through the exact same thing, the exact same thing, right? And that was very emotional to watch like play out on this huge stage and people that I worked with were drawing those comparisons as well. They knew I was such a big fan and thought it was ironic that my career almost mirrored his when it came to my time in the company. But what was really ironic, I guess, maybe for those people was because I was a fan of Derek Jeter and what he did, it wasn't about his accomplishments for me on the field. I mean, those were great, 
But for me, it was the way he was a consummate professional when it came to dealing with fans, when it came with dealing with the press, when it came to dealing with other players, whether it's his team or other teams, he was always professional. One of the most professional and most charismatic, sure, but just genuine people that you would ever see. And he played for the New York Yankees for 20 years. I mean, there's a lot of players that get eaten alive playing in New York City. I mean, there's a lot of temptations, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in your career being in a place like that. Jeter never, ever let the pressure get to him. He never came to any of those temptations that took him away from the game or took him away from the right path. He's somebody who made his family proud, made the organization proud, made his teammates proud, made the fans proud to say they were proud. They were fans of the Yankees and fans of Derek Jeter. He never let them down. There was never a controversy about steroids or drugs or anything like that. He, there was never a controversy in some sort of tabloid with him. He was somebody who maybe the closest to a perfect role model that you could find in the world of sports and or entertainment uh, anywhere. And it's sad to me that a lot of people don't know about that side of Jeter because they're just simply not sports fans. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up. I mean, everyone that's listening to this podcast might not watch baseball, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. Um, I enjoy baseball. I've liked it for many years, right? And and enjoy watching the Yankees. But if it wasn't for that affinity for the game that I already had, I would never probably would not know much about Eric Jeter. So I would recommend, even if you don't watch baseball, you're not a fan of sports or baseball or what have you, they have a lot of programs on the Yes Network on cable. One of them is called Yankeeography, and obviously there's a Derek Jeter biography on there. If you get a chance someday and it's on TV, check it out. Again, it's not about the game. It's not about how many home runs or stolen bases or hits he had or anything like that. It's about how he carried himself, how he talked to people, how he talked to the fans. And, you know, was Jeter arrogant? Yeah, you know what? He was arrogant because he knew he was the best (laughs) and he was confident and he always had that confidence. And even though he was an arrogant person in that regard, (laughs) that never carried over in a negative way or in a bad way. It came across in a very confident way, in a positive way. And I think there's a lot of maybe pro Magic players that could learn a lesson or two from Derek Jeter. (laughs) Not all. There's a lot of great ones out there, as talking about some earlier. But definitely, there's a lot of people, not just the Magic, but in the world right now that could learn a lot from Derek Jeter. I mean, I'm coming from the point of view being in the States. I mean, there's a lot of political turmoil. And so even aside from that, I mean, just go online. I mean, the pro tour this past weekend, there were moments when that Twitch chat was toxic. Uh, the meme on YouTube is YouTube comments are toxic. Although I feel like my comments for the most part are very, very positive, And that's because of all of you. So thank you for that. I want to say that because that's very important <laughs> that I have a positive community and I take a lot of pride in that. Uh, but, you know, the joke being there's a lot of places you can go where Things are very, very negative. Derek Jeter, if more people had him as a role model, would not see that. The other thing that really spoke to me about his career and about him as an an individual is he carried himself in this professional, responsible way all the time. And for all of you out there who work in different jobs or careers, because this happened to me, if you ever have a leader or boss tell you, you know what, you do a good job, but you could be better. Maybe you'd get that promotion or what have you. If you were a little harsher, a little colder, a little meaner, you'd be better. You'd be better if you were stronger willed in a negative way towards people or to the people around you, to your team. If you ever get advice like that, I'm going to tell you right now, that person does not know what they're talking about. A good leader will help you find what your potential opportunities are. Nobody's perfect. And there are things that you are doing wrong today that if somebody sat down with you and could help you see them and help you get on a path to correct them, you will be more successful in your career. You could get that promotion. But you know what's not valid feedback? You're too nice. 
you're too maybe introverted. You're too maybe soft-spoken. You know what? Jeter in some ways was all those things. And he was one of the best of all time. And he did that because it's not about your personality. It's about how you carry yourself. It's about taking the personality you have and being the best you that you can be. And that's what Derek Jeter emulated every single day on that ball field when he went out there 162 games a year, every game in the playoffs. And that's why I have a connection with somebody like this and like Derek Jeter. And it's sad that it is an end of an era. He retired a few years ago now. His number now officially retired. Time moves on. (laughs) Things move on. In a couple years, he'll be eligible for the Hall of Fame. He will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He is still involved in baseball. He just recently was in a group making a purchase for the Florida Marlins. So he is at least in a management ownership level now being involved. So that's cool. It's not like he's going away. Still a young guy. Still got a lot of his life ahead of him. Uh, About to have his first child with his wife. I mean, that's awesome. I'm happy for him because now he can live his life. Because I don't think he really had a life that was his when he was playing for the Yankees those 20 years. Which I can, again, understand coming from the large corporation I worked for for that time period. And uh, at some point, I'll tell that story. Uh, Obviously, we're running out of time today but at some point I'll, I'll talk a little more about what i used to do and stuff like that because it is kind of interesting people do have a lot of questions about it but uh that's what i wanted to talk about today and i just want to leave you on that note again it's not about the sport it's not about the game it's not about stats or anything like that this is about somebody that i think is an amazing person who really was successful and did things the right way and showed people like me and a lot of other people out there that you can be true to yourself do things the right, professional, correct, responsible way. Have respect for yourself, respect for your teammates, respect for the organization, and you can still be one of the greatest ever and be one of the best ever. And that's awesome. So having said that, that's the podcast for today. Again, let me know your thoughts on everything that we talked about today. I'd love to hear your comments, as always in the section below. So until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon and have a great day.